As the title says, uh, the blessings of a long married life. <coughs> title of the lesson I have uh, for today. Marriage is like the weather. It goes through four seasons. Each season in marriage has its particular characteristics and slowly transforms into another season with its own beauty and joy and challenges. Young people think that the most beautiful part of marriage is the beginning and they think that because all they've experienced is the beginning. But those of us who've been married for a while know that God has put special things in each season of marriage to give it its own particular joy. For example, we begin with the spring days of marriage, of finding the right spouse and the excitement of the new marriage relationship. And then we continue with the summer issues of developing intimacy and solidifying our union and our family. And all couples eventually experience the problems that marriages run into in the fall period of life when they're dealing not only with growing teenagers, but with elderly parents and doing that at the same time. And then finally, there's the winter season of marriage, a time where God has placed special gifts for those who reach this milestone of married life. And so this morning, I'd like to share with you some of the priceless benefits awaiting those who remain together and in Christ for a lifetime. We often talk about the rewards of those who remain faithful to Christ for a lifetime, and so we should. But I'd also like to add to that the blessings that await those who remain married and faithful to their partners for a lifetime as Christians. There are some rewards there for those individuals as well. Now traditionally, the most precious metals and stones have been silver and gold and, and diamonds. In our modern age, there are, these are being replaced by other costlier elements. But for the sake of my lesson this morning, I'd like to label the three blessings of a long married life as silver and gold and diamonds. And so we begin with the silver of a long married life, and that is wholeness. Wholeness is the complete opposite of loneliness. It was the primary spiritual and emotional gift that God gave to Adam after he was created. In Genesis 2 verse 18 it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The gift of marriage is the gift of potential wholeness. You know, you often hear people trying to express this idea when speaking of their spouse and their good experience of marriage. They'll say, he fulfills me. Or she will say, or, or, they'll, or, or he will say, she makes me feel complete. I wasn't complete until she came along. Again, the Bible expresses this sentiment with its own special words. In Genesis 2, uh, verse 24, it says, therefore uh, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Note, I use the King James Version here for a particular reason. It uses the word to cleave. Uh, simply means to be glued to. No tighter relationship can exist. And so uh, there, there must be this continual cleaving, if you wish, in order to produce the eventual result of having one flesh, or as we have said today, wholeness. It's not just on the day that you get married and you say, I do, that you have wholeness, that you have cleaving. Notice, you shall cleave. It's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing to hang on to, to be glued to. 
our, pair, uh, our, our partner. It's in this way that we ultimately arrive at the wonderful gift of wholeness in marriage. Wholeness or one flesh, as I say, doesn't happen just on the wedding day or on the honeymoon. Wholeness is the product of a lifetime of intimacy, a lifetime of dying to self in a thousand little ways, a lifetime of mutual service and mutual encouragement. Some think that wholeness is about sexual fulfillment, but wholeness goes beyond the physical union that married couples have. We become whole or one in mind and soul and body as well. And so much so that even others see the wholeness of our union. And what a precious thing that wholeness is for a couple. For example, wholeness enables a couple to maintain their families into the second and into the third generation. How many families are anchored by the love and the wholeness witnessed in an aged couple of grandparents or great grandparents? Their wholeness is an ideal against which every other relationship in the family is measured. Their unity represents the center, the home, the security of family and what is right and what is true and what is good. Their wholeness is the treasure that that entire family shares together as one. And wholeness also gives strength for adversity. We read in Ecclesiastes verse four, Solomon writes, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And the cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Solomon refers to the bond of friendship here in this passage, but his words can easily be applied to marriage as well. Wholeness provides the kind of strength we need to deal with all of the good and the bad variables of life. For example, someone we have to rejoice with and someone we have to share sorrow with. I've always said that joy is multiplied and sorrow is divided when we are whole with someone else in marriage. Even death is better faced after living a life where we have been whole with another person. I've said to my wife, uh, if it happens that you go before me, I will be sad, of course, but I will know what it is like to have loved somebody. And I will know what it is like to have someone love me for a lifetime. And that will be my comfort in the day when you are gone, if you are gone before me. As Charles Dickens, the writer said, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. In the end, all the songs of youthful love, all the movies and books with a romantic theme, all of these things appeal to the yearning that all people have to be whole. A lifetime of faithful partnership in marriage yields the precious silver of that wholeness that Hollywood and Madison Avenue only dream about. The next treasure of a long married life is the gold of peacefulness. Peacefulness. Peacefulness is the opposite of stress and anxiety. It is the most sought after state for the individual mind in our society today. 
Drug companies sell billions of dollars worth of pills to calm our nerves, to soothe our anxieties. Every year more books, uh, book titles come out claiming to have found the way or the cure or the system or the diet or the exercise that will bring us peace in some manner. But none of these things have been able to replace or improve upon the peacefulness that is produced by a lifetime of a faithful, happy marriage partnership. Marriage moves people into a constant flow of concessions and adjustments that promote the healthy mind and attitude necessary to have peacefulness. In Philippians 4 verse 7, Paul says that God's peace is the peace that surpasses understanding. And God can and does calm our spirit in Christ for reasons and ways that we don't always understand or perceive. Marriage, however, has this effect on us as well, except we know and we can describe the reasons. It's not beyond our understanding, it's, it's within our grasp, and that's part of the pleasure of this peacefulness that comes from a long, faithful, married life. We are at peace because we have a soulmate. There's no searching anymore. I, 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 don't, I don't look at other women because other women are not beautiful. I don't look at other women because I found the woman that I want. I found the woman whose beauty satisfies me. There's no temptation. There's no urge. I have peace in that regard. We all can have that peace in this regard because there's no searching. We are at peace because the adjustments and the fine tuning of our relationship have been completed and we can just enjoy the ride. You know, when you first start out, when you're first married, you know, sometimes you, you say something and whoops, <laughs> you, you set off an explosion. What did I say? What did I, what, what did I do? You know, you just, you don't know each other a whole lot. But after a long, faithful, married life, you know, you all, you all, you know where the minefield is, right? I mean, you can start a fight if you want to, <laughs> but you don't want to. You don't want to because you enjoy the peace so much. We're at peace because we've obeyed God's most basic command to establish a home and family, and we have remained faithful to that goal for a lifetime. We're at peace because we have maintained the vows of sticking with our partner through thick and through thin, and there is great peace that comes from this. There's great peace that comes from thinking, I was there when you needed me. And there's great peace that comes from knowing you were there when I needed you the most. Being at peace with our partner also helps us to be at peace with the rest of our family and with society as well. Paul says the following, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Romans 14 verse 19, marriage is the basic framework for personal peace because it is within this relationship that we have a lifetime opportunity to edify or to build up another person at close range. A constant effort to support and encourage and serve and forgive and satisfy and delight and share makes for a peaceful heart and mind and attitude. The golden gift of peace is found most often in individuals who have been blessed with a long and happy marriage union. For those who possess it, it is a constant joy and blessing that affects their homes and their families and all that they come in contact with. For those who are younger, this treasure is a worthy goal for which to 
persevere through every stage of married life. I tell young, younger folks who may be having a little bit of a rough patch in their relationship, it's worth it. It's worth it. Stick it out. Do what you have to do. There's a reward at the end. God will bless you. And then we said silver and gold. And then there's the beautiful diamond of hopefulness given to those who have a long and faithful married life. Hopefulness is the opposite of fear and discouragement. Regardless of the wholeness and peacefulness that we experience in a lifetime relationship, there comes a time when the union is over. I mean, this is why the wedding vows say that the marriage is to last until death parts the couple. Well, the diamond of hope is reserved for those who not only have maintained a lifelong union in marriage, but have also been united to Jesus Christ by faith and by obedience as well. There's a double gift for that married couple. Advanced age brings special problems and challenges. The long illness of, a, of our marriage partner or caring for a spouse while we ourselves are not well. How many just in our own congregation have had that experience that one, one partner is you know, seriously handicapped and dealing with all kinds of physical ailments and then their husband or wife falls very, very ill and they have to take care of them. That happens all the time. Or the difficulty of placing our spouse in a, a long-term care facility or even, even dealing with that ourselves. Our mind may be fine, but our body doesn't allow us to do what we need to do and we just need to be in a hospital or a long-term care place. That's not easy. I, I, I can imagine what that goodbye is like between a husband and a wife if she's driving him to the place where now he's going to live because he can't live at home because she's not strong enough to take care of him. Can you imagine what that goodbye is like? All right, I'll see you. Don't worry, I'll, I'll be here tomorrow. I'll, I'll come tomorrow and see you when your marriage is broken down into visitation times. That's not an easy thing. Then there is the constant concern for our own children and their well-being. And of course, there's always the reality that our lives are almost up. We've used up the time that God has given us. These are just some of the problems facing elder couples. But these things are balanced with the very real hope that the best of life is yet to come when we finally see our Lord Jesus Christ in the twinkling of an eye after we die. The diamond of hopefulness brings us great comfort in the knowledge that, first of all, the separation is not forever. Christians only sleep, the Bible says, because one day they will awaken at the return of Jesus Christ. In every scene the Bible describes of people who are in heaven, those people have retained their identities. Jesus mentions Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as being in heaven as themselves in Matthew chapter eight. The hope that we will see one another again is not just some pipe dream, is not just some Walt Disney fantasy idea that comes from a cartoon, it's a promise from God himself. It is a sure promise for a Christian couple and smooths out the bumpy road uh, that we encounter, especially at the end of physical life. The diamond of hope promises this. The diamond of hope also promises no more suffering. The drawbacks and limitations of this life will be eliminated, both physical 
and emotional. Where there is no sin, there is no suffering and there is no death. Where there is no tempter, there is no temptation and consequently no struggle. In Revelation 20, 10, the Bible tells us that Satan is punished and separated from us forever. And in Revelation 21, verse four, the promise stands that there are no tears in heaven, no pain in heaven. Christians can look forward to a time when they will consciously have no pain or suffering or sin, and old age is the final stage before reaching this point for most people. Couples united to Christ know that suffering and pain will one day be replaced with happiness and a powerful new eternal body. And then the diamond of hope also promises perfect oneness in Christ. The Bible tells us that marriage is only a reflection, only a preparation for the true relationship to which we are all called to be a part of, and that is the relationship between Christ and his church. I so appreciate what William said during the communion. That's usually a, this is usually a thing I reserve for Marty and I, as in Marty and I, we have not discussed what each of us is going to be preaching on, and somehow, so often, both lessons sort of seem, seem to snap together. Well, you know, William and I did not discuss what we were going to be talking about, and yet, his uh, brief comments during the communion uh, perfectly fit into what I'm trying to share uh, with us uh, this morning. Couples in Christ can look forward to perfect wholeness as part of the Godhead, sitting and ruling with Christ at the right hand of God. 2 Timothy 2 uh, verse 12. Uh, couples in Christ can look forward to perfect peace for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter eight, verse one. Couples in Christ can look forward to perfect unity between themselves, no matter how good the relationship was on earth, it'll be better in heaven. Our relationship with everybody will be so much better in heaven. Just like a diamond given with great hope at the moment of engagement, that diamond will shine throughout a lifetime and keep its glitter even when the people of that couple are old and gray, that diamond keeps on sparkling. Well, the diamond of hopefulness will also provide its beautiful sparkle and value for all those who put their faith in Christ Jesus. Even when the end comes, that hope, that promise remains as strong as ever. So, let me summarize some of the comments I've made and, and make my invitation to you uh, this morning. My, my appeal, of course, this morning is that every single person in this auditorium believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you have already or will decide today to express your faith by repenting of your sins and being uh, baptized as Jesus and the apostles have clearly taught us in Mark 16, 16 and Acts 2, 38 and in so many other places in the New Testament. My first appeal is always be saved, be saved today. My, my prayer um, is that each one here find a Christian marriage partner to complete who you were designed by God to be and to become. And believe me, this is not only a prayer that I mention in a public sermon, but it is a prayer that I often make in private for the many single and widowed and unmarried people of this congregation. I pray for you. You may not know it, but if you're single or widowed or unmarried, I pray for you that if it is God's will, He will provide you someone to complete you, to give you wholeness and to give you peace. Because the first rule in Genesis is that it is not good for man to be alone. That's the first teaching. And every other teaching on marriage is based on that teaching. 
And then finally, my hope is that all who are married in Christ will remain faithful to Him. I so appreciate what the elders uh, have put in the bulletin this week. Just a reminder, just a reminder for us to, to be faithful in the little things, Bible class, worship, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, you know, activities of the church, don't get lazy, don't get sloppy in that kind of thing. I so appreciate that they have you know, come forward and, and put that right out there, right on the front page of, of the bulletin uh, as a reminder to all of us uh, to, 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 to tighten up and, and, and to focus on our spiritual lives. I'm, I'm very happy that they, they did that. And my hope, of course, is that everyone here be faithful and remain faithful to Christ and remain faithful to one another in marriage and remain faithful to one another in Christian friendship as well. Because there's nothing more that Satan would prefer uh, uh, and that is to separate those who are married and to separate those who are friends and to separate those who are in the family for whatever reason that he can find. And so my, my hope is that we'll all be faithful to one another in whatever type of relationship that we have in Christ. Well, I pray that God bless you and help you now if you need to respond to the Spirit's invitation as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.